Okay, if I could have your attention. Um, this is our third resident association meeting this year. And what we do at this meeting, as dictated by the bylaws, is we kind of uh, go through a little bit of an annual report. Now the big annual report will come out in written form. So this will be an abbreviated form. And since there's nine of us on uh, a number of uh, committees, what I've asked everybody to do is come up, say which committee they are the liaison to, and give us one major achievement for their particular committee. So that's what we're gonna do in the first part of this presentation. And in the second part, Christy Battistone is gonna come up and give us the financial picture and the information that all of you have been um, eagerly, eagerly awaiting. So I'm gonna go first. So um, my report, my annual report is for the resident council in general. So we did a lot of things this year and I'm just gonna talk about a few very, very briefly. So I would say one of the major achievements was the development of the policy and procedure for committees. Um, some of the things that we did was to restart the EARS program. And also, I thought it was important that you be able to get the information from the residence council in all types of ways. In other words, you could attend or you could watch it on Zoom. So I asked Jason if he could arrange to have a Zoom link sent to every single resident with the agenda so you would always know about the meeting and be able to listen to it from your home. Now I know we had all kinds of problems with the audio system, but they're still being worked on. So what I'm gonna do now is introduce you to each person and they will come up and give their report on their individual uh, committee. Tamar? Um, being on the council, all of us sit on at least two committees. I think some people sit on three committees. Can you all hear me? Close, okay. Um, one of the committees I sit on is that I am the liaison from the council to the board of directors. The board of directors meets not monthly, but a number of times a year. And I give a summary of, of what's been going on in, in the council. I would say the biggest change is that in the past, the board of directors received copies of the council minutes and summaries of data um, in kind of numerical form. I didn't know this, so I started writing a narrative of high points of the council meetings. And it turned out that the board members appreciated that and felt that it brought, brought in a kind of more human quality of what the council discusses, how it deals with things. And so we've kept that, and that's been a very satisfying format. So that's, I would say that's the biggest change. The other committee that I sit on is the design and decor committee. And I think you all know that they're in charge of all the artwork throughout Woodland Pond, except the cottages. I'm assuming, um, all, all the corridors, all the public spaces. And they are also in charge of the furniture in public spaces. If uh, they come across furniture that would be useful that somebody's giving away, they decide if there's a place for it. I think the biggest achievement, well, the main achievement is they're constantly hanging paintings, moving paintings, rearranging paintings. And this year they started to do something a little bit new. 
of taking small works and putting them in an arrangement on the wall. So instead of saying, oh, this is too small, it will get lost. If you have four or so pieces, you have a, a, a rich arrangement. They've been doing that. And they rearranged the furniture in the lobby, the independent living uh, entry lobby. And people have said that it's much more inviting and we see that the couches are used much more. Uh, when people come in, it's easy to come to a couch and sit down on it. So that's been very gratifying to see much more activity uh, in that couch area in the lobby. Thank you. Questions? Do we have questions? Jeffrey. Yeah. Are there any constraints on which pictures, for instance, news, yeah. may be hung on the wall? Yes. <laughs> it is my impression that they are not usually hanging nudes on the wall. I can't swear that that's absolute policy. But more generally, I mean, I see the point of not having political posters on the right. Way, but what's the difference? What are the criteria that are being applied? Come to a meeting. Yes. Come to a meeting. Okay. Okay. The, it, the meetings are the first Thursday of every month at one o'clock in the classroom. Come to a meeting, and you, you'll hear a lot of stuff. Thank you, Tamar. Uh, Betsy? Wow, it's nice to see so many people. The purpose of the Dining Services Committee is to represent the residents and convey to management the residents' wishes and needs regarding menu options, food quality, and adequacy of service. Our greatest accomplishment this year has been welcoming Amy as Director of Dining, Jared as Executive Chef, Tanya as Dining Room Manager, and Ruth, Assistant Dining Room Manager, and Hostess Extraordinaire. The Dining Service Committee's working relationship with the Dining Management is extremely positive which has made a huge difference in their openness to, openings, openness to suggestions from the committee. We now have continuous serving from 10 to 2 in the pub, simply to go items available in the cooler in the pub, lunch in the bistro from noon to 2, a more flexible reservation system for dinner, increased choices of sides and number of entrees offered at dinner, expanded choices at Sunday brunch, a much better trained team of servers, and well-prepared and nicely presented fresh food. Positive comments from residents continue to increase. It is quite obvious that there have been many improvements in the quality of dining at Woodland Pond, largely due to receptiveness by dining management to suggestions from the dining committee. Thank you, Betsy. House? House Cross has a number of committees. purpose is to facilitate the settling in process of new residents with the help from personal mentors. We have assisted 46 new residents this year 
and there are at least nine more due by the end of the year. Uh, I hope if anybody is dissatisfied with their welcome, they would let us know how to improve. Library committee consists of 12 volunteer members. The goal is to manage the always changing and growing collection of reading materials at Woodland Pond for the pleasure of the residents and staff. I asked the chair, excuse me, of the committee, and this is what she is um, proud of as accomplishing this year. <coughs> the first was the unusual um, challenge of sharing space with the concierge <laughs> during our movie careers. Um, they, um, we also provided a well-received open house for residents and also um, keeping up with a collection of weeding the books that do not get read. We check each time they're taken out so we have a, a census of the books that are never used, which we put on the giveaway table, which people like. Um, and at the same time, you know, putting the new books there, which all of you are so generous about uh, donating. And the third committee is the Health Center Committee, which has 11 members. They all have a connection, a personal, maybe not the dining, but the others are representing um, uh, yeah, right, assisted living, garden view, and skilled nursing. They have personal current connection with each of those units so that they are very much aware of the, the, need, the needs and feelings of the residents and take a list every month of the uh, the things that are not wonderful there and try to fix it. And then there's the two who, at least two, who uh, do, go deal with dining, which of course is almost the main point of many people. So um, that, um, they try to, resolve all the problems, that the, which of course can't happen 100%, but um, temperature of the rooms, temperature of the water, temperature of the food, content of the food. Here again, as Betsy said, that has improved enormously with our new uh, dining staff. Um, there have, uh, access to the garden is a problem for some people and communication, of course. There are just so many different needs that it's a, a, a real challenge. Um, Philip Mayle, the director of the Health Center, um, attends every meeting. He gives a report at every meeting and he often can answer the questions and he takes notes of the um, dissatisfactions of the residents. So it's a very effective, active committee. Thank you. Our next presenter will be June Finer. I'm the liaison to the Land Conservation Committee, which was previously known as the Millbrook Preserve Committee, and we meet on the third Friday of every month at three o'clock in the classroom, and you're all welcome to attend our meetings. Um, we cooperate closely with the Millbrook Preserve, which is our backyard neighbor, and part of which is an easement from us. Um, several of our members are trail stewards and several participate in work projects including one who makes all the beautiful wooden trail signs. 
um, every two months, every two months on the third Tuesday at two o'clock in the pack, we sponsor a presentation relating to land conservation. And twice a year, in the spring and the fall, we arrange an event to bring our residents who wish down to the outdoors to visit our trails and the observation platform. And now Bill Walls. Hello, I'm on the Landscape Committee. We, we gather once a month, except during the uh, cold winter uh, months, to talk about landscaping issues and to hear from uh, Woodland Pond landscaper Mark Eisenhandler and to make uh, recommendations around the landscaping. And uh, last week, we walked around uh, with Mark, uh, walked around the campus accompanied by uh, Crystal and Cameron um, Michelle Gamolia was originally uh, uh, going to go with us, but it turned out she couldn't go. Uh, so uh, the two of them uh, took, took note of our issues to bring back to uh, Michelle. Thank you, Bill. And now Yaakov Pippen. Good afternoon, everybody. I am the liaison from the council and I'm also a member of the um, Sustainability Committee since it was formed. The Sustainability Committee has a specific goal and I'm not going to detail that, but we are welcome to see it in a number of things that we publish and put in the library. The elevator pitch of the Sustainability Committee is to evaluate, educate, and advocate for things related to the environment and the, you know, the, the world we live in. And I'm a, a member of the, um, the steering committee of the committee of the sustainability committee, together with uh, with June, Nora, and uh, George Brown, and Don Sangre. Sorry. Sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Yeah, enjoy dry so. Um I was asked to try to summarize the achievements, but I think what I'm going to do is uh, we recently reorganized basically all our different activities and subgroups and task groups into three groups, basically. One of them is the educational events, and under that category, we have a number of things that you probably participated over in the year, during the year. One of them was the Earth Week, the other one was the Repair Cafe, which was uh, basically, we did two events this year. Uh, we have the presentations, we had the fall this year that was, I think, and there is still a reminder there on the, on the screen of the, you know, uh, the presentation. We have a lecture series alternating with the Land Conservation Committee every other month. And we also organize the library resource shelf in matters related to sustainability. The other part is a committee that kind of encompasses all the ongoing activities. And some of those are, you are familiar with them. One of them is the issues of composting and your organization and managing the compost bins and what people do for composting the trash rooms, monitoring what goes in the trash so that it doesn't get mixed. Um, we have the in-house recycling program, and we have the ongoing collection of goose paper, good on the other side, which a lot of people have been using, and we are looking for further utilization. And we had a successful uh, campaign in using the three compartments plastic containers that people used to take home from the dining room. And to such an extent that at some point we were donating part of that stream to organizations outside of Woodland Pond, but recently we were just told that the program is so successful that for the last year and a half since we started, Woodland Pond has not purchased more of those containers. And as a result, we don't have enough to give to other organizations, but that's a measure of success. The other one is the egg cartons and so on and so forth. So these are ongoing activities. 
And the last one, uh, the last group is the communications group. And we have a, about 40 member uh, mailing list of people that express some interest in sustainability. Um, we have also um, uh, connections to climate change organizations outside of Woodland Pond and, and local environmental programs uh, with local almost continuously in the newsletter, the Chanticleer announcement about sustainability matters. Now, my last sentence is, please volunteer to work on sustainability matters. There is too much for us to do alone. And in spite of the fact that we have 40 people that express vague interest, we need more people to put their hands and work with us to you know, make a possible change to the climate environment that we face. Uh, next is Carl Rodman. Carl Rodman also serves as vice president on the uh, Residence Council. Thank you. Ooh, I see why some of you said that there are a lot of people out there. You don't realize it until you get up here. Uh, two committees. One is the nominating committee. And as we found in several past years, it is extremely hard to get any of you wonderful people to volunteer. But we got five good volunteers this year with pulling teeth. And the proof of how good they were is that we had to recount the ballots four times because the election was so close. So that's the and we have two people who turned us down this year, but who promised to run next year, and we're holding them to their promise. <laughs> he didn't even blink. Okay. The other committee I'm on is the physical plan committee. It started out as a way of Tom getting ideas that he could try out with a group of volunteers. It became a council committee. We mostly find out all kinds of things that are going on here, most of which he tells you at the next question and answer period. But the one issue I'd like to mention that we had some interesting influence was the issue of the dog park. How many of you have dogs here? Raise your hand. Just a few. Uh, it was a big controversy at the beginning of this year would we build a dog park or would we not? And we went back and forth with all the pros and cons. And we had opinions and they had opinions and even the dog owners were on both sides of the issue. It was much more complicated than we thought. And the ultimate decision was made by Michelle going out to talk to other CCRCs and coming to a consensus of what's being done. But that was the most interesting experience we had. So what's the, no, no. We decided not to have them. <laughs> I can say my dog was not happy about that. <laughs> she voted, but they didn't count it. <laughs> Tom. Thank you. Tom Gilder. I was um, newly elected to the board um, early this year. And I know the reason that you're all here is you're waiting for that crunchy kumquat casserole that I promised. But I just got word supply chain, the kumquat containing company has run into no containers. So hold on, it's still coming. Anyway, I am uh, liaison to three committees. The first one is Rove, regarding our valued employees. Suzanne Otruski is the chair. Dave Smith is the vice chair. This year, the Rove Committee introduced a monthly article to be included in the Woodland Life Reader, or excuse me, newsletter. Most articles called Employee Profile featured representative employees from the various departments. Our goal is to familiarize residents with the names, faces of some of the people who benefit from their donations to Rome. Also, for the first time, 
Instead of relying solely on printed memos and reminders, we personally contacted all residents who moved to Woodland Pond since January, you heard that's a very large number. We were pleased to learn that many already knew about the program and contributed to Rome. The response from all residents was very, very positive. Okay, the second committee that I represent is the Financial Review Committee. Chair is Dave DeWild, Vice Chair is Joe Tam. The Financial Committee has made great strides this year in learning about CCRC's requirement for financial oversight and coordinating with the Woodland Pond Board's Finance Committee to improve their effectiveness at the residents council level. Very, very important uh, considerations. The third committee that I work with is the Woodland Pond Benefit Fund. Ann Gordon is chair, vice chair is Vicki Danskin. Their accomplishments this year is the Kaleidoscope, <coughs> excuse me, Arts and Crafts Fair that was just held was successful with raising $2,336. Very nice accomplishment. Uh, grants for 2022 included funding for the repairs and truck, and I'm gonna say the truck is what the piano rides on, um, and for the major improvements that are ongoing with the audiovisual equipment here in the back. Um, they also added a new member. Uh, plans going forward include funding for scholarships to the staff, uh, to staff in the health center, investigation and improvements to outside space for health center residents. I think um, Alice talked a little bit about that. And fund speaker fees for various subjects of interest to the community. Um, and now this is a commercial, so forgive me, um, but no, forgive me. We are all urged to come for the wine and cheese treat. Wine and chocolate. That's me. My bad. <coughs> November 13th at 2 p.m. here at the PAC. All right, come register at the uh, registration for a uh, place it is beginning concierge November 1st. Okay, that's all I've got. Thank you, John. Okay, um, one second. Um, so anybody that's new to Woodland Pond must say, wow, look at all those committees and all the good things they do. So I think we should give a round of applause to all the volunteers, all the liaisons, and all the committee heads. Thank you. It's amazing what people get done in this community. It's really pretty impressive. And uh, I continue to be impressed every year that I live here. So now the main event, Christy Battistoni. I'm sorry, you will have to excuse me. I have a doctor's visit, but Christy will take it from here.
today I'm actually going to um, I'm going to cover two different topics. I'm going to start out with um, doing um, the financial picture as of August 31st, just because I'm just wrapping up September's financials now. So it's going to be um, as of August 31st, and then I'm going to review that. And then after that, I'm actually going to talk for a little bit on uh, Medicare, traditional Medicare, Medicare Advantage plans, because it happens to be open enrollment time, and I think it's the perfect time uh, to do that. So two topics that we're going to talk about today. By the way, there will be a handout. I'm going to leave it up at the front at the concierge um, for what I'm talking about as far as the financial aspect. And if you want to get copies, you can get it from the concierge after this. Okay. So what I'm going to show you today is um, basically what I do for the board of directors every month, which is called the flash report because they're looking for certain things um, that they want to see where we stand without getting into um, a lot of detail. So I provide this flash report to the board every month as well as the financial uh, as well as the financial review committee. So first of all I'm just going to start out with the census just because that's always a good place to begin. So this is as of August 31st. Um, in our independent living we had 197 units occupied out of 2-1 and I did a comparison to last year just so that you could see August 22 to August 21. So read it. We can't read it. Read it. Okay. Read it. Okay. Read it. Excuse me. I was starting to. Um, 197 independent living units occupied as of August 22nd of this year. Last year was 190. Um, Community wide, so including the health center as well. 271 units occupied compared to 270 last year. And then I just listed below the units that were open and available at 831, and it was three spruces and a willow. Um, actually, all our units in-house have deposits on them. People are waiting to settle as soon as the unit is um, modified. We've had to do a lot of work with new kitchens and vanities because of our age 13, you know, we're 13 years old. So um, Shannon has pretty much all of our in inventory sold. Um, Waitlist deposits, people that have waitlist deposits at Woodland Pond, 35 this year compared to 19 last year. So it's a big improvement. And at 831, we had 332 residents in Woodland Pond compared to 324 last year as of August. That's just basically a census snapshot. Anybody have any questions on that? The 332 includes all independent living and the health care. Correct. What would be just IL? About 100 less? Um, it's a more. I think we had, at this point in time, 78 people in um, the health center. So. We're, we're usually like 250 something, 259, somewhere in that ballpark. Mm -hmm. okay. <coughs> okay, so this is um, our financial flash report. And this is, um, I took some of the, I kind of squashed down some of the ratios and whatnot, but this is pretty much what I give the board each month. <laughs> and basically it shows our year to date at that point in time versus our year-to-date budget. So in August, as of August 31st, we had $16.7 million in cash. So that is our, our cash, our operating cash, as well as all our trustee health funds and our trustee bank. And it's kind of broken down there, $8 million in cash, 7.9 in our trustee health funds. Last year at this time, I'm sorry, what am I saying? Uh, the budgeted number for August 31st was 13 million. So we actually are 
$3.6 million more in our cash than uh, what we budgeted for. So that's positive. That's yes, that's definitely positive. And um, days cash on hand is a covenant that we need to meet every June and December. It's measured by our bondholders. And so at August 31st, I put that so, so the uh, board members know, our days cash on hand number was 141 compared to a budget of 115, so 26 more positive days. Then we drop to, so then we talk about the revenue and I break the revenue down between the independent living revenue and the health center revenue. And then there's something called the earned entrance fees, which I'll explain what that is. So as of August, our resident independent living revenue was 7.5 million compared to a budget of 7.6 million. So it was uh, shy of budget by about $143,000. And the reason that happens is that sometimes when residents settle, they pay their entrance fee, but they can't move into their apartments yet because of the modifications that are being done and because there's been such supply chain issues. We've been trying really hard to get the apartments turned over quickly, um, but if they settle and can't move into their apartment, then we can't charge them to be here. So, um, so that's why that's a little bit of a deficit compared to our budget. Um, earned entrance fees, that is a non-cash number, basically, as far as accounting goes. Um, we bring into revenue on our books an amount of money over your life expectancy. So that's what that earned entrance fee is. It's not cash related, it's just a revenue number um, on our financials. Um, and then the health center revenue, um, so that's gonna be um, skilled, garden view, assisted living, and um, the outpatient rehab. $5.1 million was what uh, our revenue was year to date, August 31st compared to budget of 5.16, so close. Uh, I mean, actually we're 4,000 positive to budget, so that, that's right on par. And then um, other revenue was uh, 456,000 compared to a budget of 227,000. Obviously we had the poker face money that came in, so that's kind of why that number is uh, positive to budget year to date. So, so total revenue, 15.9 million to a budget of 15.8 as of August 31st. Positive $111,000 variance on the revenue side. Now, dropping to our expenses, salaries and benefits, obviously always our most expensive um, expense that we have here. Um, our actual year-to-date at August 31st was 8.3 million compared to a, a budget of 8.1. So negative to budget by 133,000. And then our operating expenses, pretty much our overall operating expenses, um, 4.3 million dollars compared to budget of 4.2 so that there's an overage of 144,000 that I'm sure Michelle explained yesterday at the meeting our expenses are increasing rapidly um, um, we still last we have done this the COVID line obviously that's we had nine thousand dollars of COVID expenses um, compared to a budget of 32,000 so that's actually positive I'm probably going to start combining that with the other expense line and then our interest expense, um, 2.5 million to a budget of 2.6, so pretty much right in line with what uh, budget is. And then our depreciation and amortization, non-cash expense, 2.9 to a 2.8 budget, so that's um, over budget by $106,000. And part of that is, uh, you know, we um, spent a lot on, on capital improvements, so obviously the depreciation increased on that. So our total expenses year to date, 18 million to 17.9, so over budget by $327,000 as of um, August 31st. And then that's just some unrealized uh, gains and losses on investment. 
and, and actually, so I also give the board, if you want to, if you look down below, the actual cash basis. So the top is non-cash revenue and expenses included in how I have to prepare our financial statements, but in order for them to see our actual cash in and out is on this section down here, which is our, our revenue for 831, which was 13.2 million compared to a budget of 13.1, so a positive 99,000. Cash expenses, 15.2 to 14.9, so over by 232,000. So the board gets both numbers. Christy? Yes. Where in the expenses is where you have to pay out the 50, 70, and 90 percent refunds? Okay, so our our, our, brief, our refundable contracts are actually sitting on our balance sheet. Um, and I didn't get you, I didn't bring the, um, the actual balance sheet and whatnot, but we have like $46 million of refundable fees sitting there right now. is always interested in our entrance fees and our refunds. As of August 31st, we had, we brought in $6.7 million of the entrance fees this year in 2022, compared to a budget of 4.9 million. So we're positive to budget on entrance fees right now of $1.7 million. And then our refunds that we paid, it, and actually I'll say on the entrance fees that uh, we brought in, we've had 13 settlements as of August 31st. Um, and refunds, we paid out $3.4 million. We budgeted that it would be $4.3 million. So we're actually positive to budget on our refunds as well this year of $940,000. So net entrance fee right, right now is positive to budget of $2.7 million. This is a breakdown of our cash. <coughs> cash in the bank, $7.9 million as of 831 compared uh, to last year, which was 4.5. And these are our trustee held funds, our debt service, reserve fund, our interest, our principal. I have to um, wire money to our trustee bank every month so that our interest and principal are funded so that when they're paid, the trustee has all the money already and just pays the bondholders. And in September 15th, our interest payment was paid and our principal was paid. Um, then there's an operating reserve fund. And then there's this is a, a capital replacement reserve, which I transfer in money each year. I mean, if we needed to dip into, if there was an issue and we couldn't pay for things out of our uh, operating funds, um, we were having this, this fund grow. And then these are our, our waitlist deposits. Last year it was 190, and now, like I said before, there were 35 of them, so they're $10,000 a pop, so there's $350,000 in um, deposits right now. So our, our total cash, 16.7 this year, compared to 13.1 last year. Go ahead. Where does food purchase show up and how much is it? So on our, um, our, I'll show you right here. So all of our expenses, everything is right in our other operating, $4.3 million as year to date. That's everything. That's, that's food. That's, um, Medical supplies, mowing the lawn, um, snow, every, every, every supply in house, other than the broken down of salaries, is right there in that. In the, uh, because I have a million general ledger lines for expenses, but everything's in that other operating expense line. 
So what? And I'd say it's been about eighty thousand a month. Thank you. It's a little bit lower, and it's been climbing. <laughs> So right now we're, as far as our cash perspective, um, and being over our day's cash on hand, that's good. Question. I have a question. Sure. Is the wait list based uh, to some extent on actuarial statistics? No, our, our wait list with the 35 people is people that are interested in Woodland Pond, but the apartment that they want is not available, so they have to wait list and most of those are for cottages and the larger units. I don't know, I'm sure Jim Michelle, she probably uh, approached the Silver Birches and talked about the, the new, they broke ground on the, yeah. So hopefully that's exciting. Things go well with that. Um, anybody have any other questions on this? We're talking about next year's budget. I'm sorry. Are you talking about next year's budget? No, not in this meeting because the board hasn't, we're, it's being presented to the Audit and Finance Committee tomorrow and then it goes to the board for approval. So the budget, that's going to have to be a presentation. I'm going to have to set up and do it on my own probably in November. Right, I know, so the timing so of this, yesterday. yeah, the timing of this is just that, yeah. So it goes to the Audit and Finance Committee tomorrow if they approve if, and then they recommend it to the board at the board meeting next week. And then once it's adopted, we have to send it into the state by 11-1, and then I'll do a presentation separate on the budget for next year, for 2023. What does the state look for? Um, I think they like to, I mean, obviously, as far as like the monthly service fees, basically, and, and approval, I mean, I think they wanna make sure that you're not increasing beyond what you can justify. Um, we did give them a heads up on everything, but um, everything does have to go to them for approval. How many spaces are available in the health center? So we are close to full on assisted living. And again, we always do keep a, a room or two open because if you're a contract holder and you need to be over there, we have to have space for you. And memory and garden view as well. There are beds in skill, but we also sometimes need to keep those open only because of our the staffing situations. We have to have state, safe staffing numbers. So right now, that's where our census is lower is in skill. Thank you. Anything else um, regarding this portion of my presentation? Ten thousand. Ten thousand is a waitlist deposit. Normally, it's ten percent. If but then if they do a ten percent, that means they're closing in sixty days. But if we don't have a unit to sell, then we can't. It's the ten k. Okay. So I really want to talk about Medicare and Medicare Advantage plans. Um, and I want to kind of, um, did people get their 2022 Medicare books? Okay. I don't know if anybody's ever sat around and read this, probably not, but there is a lot of good information in here. Um, I mean, I'd like to start with, originally there was just regular Medicare. We often refer to it as traditional Medicare. And then Medicare Advantage plans came around, I was shocked to find out that they actually came around in 1966. Uh, very few people were ever in, took Medicare Advantage plans. Um, they really started to take off over, I'd say, the last 20 years or so. Um, and since there was basically nobody really enrolled in a Medicare Advantage plan in 1998, but there's over 26 million people enrolled in them now as of 2021. So that's a huge, huge number. So I'm sure everybody knows that a Medicare is insurance. You get it when you're 65. It's offered by the federal government. 
is a accepted nationwide. So this is traditional Medicare. It's accepted nationwide. So if you're here, you're in California, wherever, it's going to be taken anywhere. There's two parts to um, traditional Medicare. There's part A and part B. Part A is um, when you go to the hospital for inpatient or when you come to skilled nursing. Um, traditional Medicare will pay for a portion of your stay in skilled nursing. Your Part B benefits are your doctors, your labs, x-rays, um, outpatient therapy, things like that. So that's the difference between Part A and Part B. Um, I just want to make sure everybody like, kind of knows how the whole thing goes down. And your Medicare Part B premium normally comes right out of your Social Security check. So with traditional Medicare, normally you would have what's called a Medigap policy or a supplemental plan, a secondary plan that would pick up any um, Medigap, meaning it picks up, it's the gap, it covers the gap of what Medicare does in um, co-pays and deductibles. But it's pretty much if you have traditional Medicare and a Medigap policy such as AARP, you're going to be pretty covered for going to the doctor, going to the hospital, anything. It's, it's quality coverage. Um, when you get a supplemental plan, there's 10 different plans. I'm sure you've seen plan, I have plan A or B, whatever, all the way up to plan N. And most states, even though it's not going to be the exact same, a plan A plan in New York is going to be similar coverage-wise to a plan A plan in Minnesota. Um, and actually in your book, if you have this, there's a page that details what all the plans and compares them all, what they cover. So I find this to be extremely interesting information. If you're looking for a supplemental plan and what it's gonna pick up. Woodland Pond has always required that if you have traditional Medicare, that you have a supplemental insurance plan. Now, talking about Medicare Advantage plans, they're considered a Medicare C plan. That's how that came about. They call them a Part C plan. So Medicare Advantage plans are administ administered by private insurance companies. And they do have to follow the rules of Medicare or the federal government, but they're administered by a private health insurance company. Um, and they're very attractive because usually the premiums are lower and they often include vision, hearing, dental coverage. Um, and then you, you normally wouldn't have a supplemental policy when you have a Medicare Advantage plan. But I just want to point out, um, because this is what we find here, that I don't want to say that I call it a Medicare Disadvantage plan, but often it, it's not as great as people think. Um, you often need to you often need to deal with only in-network providers if you have the Medicare Advantage plan. Um, you have these out-of-pocket maxes, but you could be um, going for a treatment for something, meet your out-of-pocket max in October, and then you start having to pay all of a sudden again in January of the next year. You need, you often need re referrals and prior authorizations. So what I wanna point out as far as Little Pond goes and our skilled nursing unit, when you go into skilled nursing, if you go to the hospital, had surgery, hip surgery, for knee, whatever, um, you have a three-day hospital stay in a hospital for really any kind of illness. You can come to a skilled nursing facility and Medicare will be paying for your stay there. And Medi traditional Medicare, original Medicare, normally covers, can cover up to 100 days, but you normally get most of those days. The Medicare Advantage plans that we've been seeing Natalie has to get a pre-off basically every three days in order for you to stay there and the max that they've been paying and covering you is 10 days. 
So then they're discharging you. They're, you don't need the coverage anymore. You don't need the service. So then it forces you to either move back to independent living and do outpatient rehab, which then you're going to be paying for out of pocket, um, subject to your health insurance, of course, but your out of pocket, your co-pays and whatnot. So it's it's concerning. It's 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 concerning, and I know that um, obviously they are very attractive. Many, do most of you know do, how many people here have Medicare Advantage plans, or do you not necessarily know? Yes. And I feel like the federal government does push it in a way, and I'm not sure like what their reasoning is that they don't want people on traditional, or I tried to research that actually to see if I could find out what the big push was. Well, it obviously it has to do with money, that's for sure. Um, but it is open enrollment now. It's open enrollment and from October 15th until December 7th. And it's, it's open enrollment from October 15th through December 7th. So what did I say? December, December 7th. So this is the time when you can change your plan, you can switch. Uh, and I'm not pushing you to do that because like I said, I understand that the Medicare Advantage plans are less expensive, you probably have no premium, but um, you really should try to look to see what it's gonna cover for you. I think originally, they, if, if you weren't sick and you were a healthy person and you just went for some routine visits, it was fine to have that. But as things happen, as you age, have health issues or whatever, you might find that um, you end up spending a lot more money um, in care than uh, what you originally thought. I also wanted to point out, my dad's an IBM retiree, and I, when he turned 65, he had to keep your traditional Medicare, and I got him a great AARP plan, supplemental. Well, um, all the IBM retirees probably just got that notice that they're trying to push everyone to um, Advantage plans. And they used to give money towards your supplemental and they're not gonna do that. So it's really forcing you into that. The literature doesn't really show you that you can stay with your traditional Medicare, but yes, now you're gonna have some out-of-pocket expense of having to buy a supplemental plan. Um, so I just, if anybody, go ahead, Richard. Well, there's been a lot recently uh, written about the Advantage plans because you're the right. There's been a lot written recently about the Medicare Advantage plans because what you just described in terms of uh, IBM, uh, some of us are pensioned in New York City and we've had similar experiences in their court cases and all of that going on. But aside from, aside from the legal aspects of it, uh, Several articles have been written about the fact that Advantage plans are not as good overall as opposed to traditional plan. And a lot of it has to do with the way it's structured. You, you are no longer, this is I think really important for people to understand, you are not a Medicare patient when you go into an Advantage plan. They, in fact, contract whatever it is, a hospital, uh, contracts with Medicare, you are a patient of the hospital, and that is very important in terms of what they have to provide for you, because the Medicare law is very specific in terms of having to provide things, so I think people have to be very careful about what they... And I think physicians do. as well aren't thrilled because they're strapped a little bit in the services that they can provide because of what's going to be covered and what's not going to be covered. Because yes, it's an insurance company that's making that decision for you. Who's me? Okay, I'll grab it. That's okay, I can walk around and do the exercise. <laughs> I believe you can switch <coughs> plans, um, open enrollment, 
Not every year, but every two or three years? No, you can. She asked about um, switching. You can always switch during open enrollment, always. Okay. Yeah. And there's no penalty if you go from Medicaid to Advantage. No, back. no. You can go either way. Correct. With the IBM plan, are you suggesting that it might be better to not have the supplement, the three thousand dollars that they paid toward your premiums, and go ahead and pay that yourself and stay with Real Medicare? Um, okay, it's hard for me. I don't want to tell you what to do. I'm just telling you what I'm, we are finding that Medicare Advantage plans cover and don't cover, and so. For my own father, I want him to keep his traditional Medicare and have his supplemental plan because well, his government will have to pay the three thousand. Right, he unfortunately so yeah. It might be better to do that. Right, so that's why people have to think about that, and make those decisions, because yes, you are going to be out of pocket paying for supplemental now, but there are different options, and that book talks. Uh, I mean, I'm a big advocate. Twenty three. I think that's a twenty. That that probably I just grabbed that from my mother's. Just I wanted to show you the book, um, but I'm sure there's a 2023 book yeah, somewhere out. Oh, okay. You did. I thought she had that too. Um, again, there's a lot of different supplemental plans. I'm a big advocate of AARP because I've always found Plan F is fantastic. F is fantastic. Um, obviously, Quad is more expensive, but it basically covers all the copays and deductibles of everything. So it's quite a, uh, it's a good plan. But there are other ARPs that are less that still cover. If anyone was interested in a deep dive to the history and the statistics and the lawsuits, the New York Times pub published an extensive report two weeks ago. There are the major providers to these advantage plans are in court because it's found that they're falsifying many of the records. They're for forcing doc physicians to say they've given certain type of treatment in order to get higher pay, but they really haven't given that treatment. That's a scary thought. They're also turning down people. Uh, they're not approving. This is not all plans, but this was the general. But all the major providers, I think there's nine, they're all in court. Uh, I, my wife is also a retiree from the New York City, and we had to yeah. face this situation yeah. Yeah. recently because the city was trying to force the retirees to go into the advantage plan. I mean, the way I looked at that and I researched it a little bit, these are private companies. They are trying to privatize Medicare and the government is letting them. And the way they make their profit is by, they are not charging you, but they are taking the money from the Medicare funding and they are also getting additional incentives to upgrade your diagnosis because the people that get the, their reimbursement from the government increases if you are at a higher diagnosis level. So this is a basically a privatization, trying to get more people and the way they make their money, provide less services. There is no, there is no way around it. And you know, it, they, they have a tremendously public PR campaign and it's not going to cost you anything. You will get uh, right. silver sneakers that That's you can exactly go twice right. a week <laughs> and so on. But the bottom line is that this is basically part of that scheme. Yeah, yeah. and I think that's why they rolled in, oh, we'll give you dental, we'll give you vision, we'll give you this, and, but I, I think a lot of that service, those services are routine services as well, so. Again, I can't explain this too well, but some of the large groups like Crystal Run and CareMount and NuVent, I can't say those per se, but groups like that, there are ways where you are a regular Medicare patient and they have REACH programs, ACO REACH, and they, in effect, become an advantage plan and you're in it without knowing it. So if anybody sees anything that says ACO reach, and it used to be another name, it's very, very tricky how you can be signed up without knowing it. And then I think if you move, I don't know if you're still considered 
regular Medicare. When you, the, if you move and leave that unit, let's say all your doctors are, are paramount. So that's particularly well, tricky. It, it, very much so. Very much so. And I'm sure people see the extensive advertising that is done, extensive on Medicare Advantage plans. And I mean, they'll call you up and they'll get you signed up, and uh, it's, it is amazing. Go ahead. So to change the subject, change the subject slightly. So we, many of us have bought a life care yes. policy. Life, I'm sorry. I have, to, I have to look at the life facts. Care. Life, life we, care. Have, we have paid a life care entrance fee. Yep. Uh, it's not a policy. But that will pay for something in the skilled nursing. Right, so that would be covering Where, your room and board. That only pays for the room and room board. It board, doesn't yeah. pay for the professional services. That's something you have to pay for anyway. Right, so if you were on life care in skills, so the instance before when I said your Medicare Advantage plan cut you off after 10 days and you still stayed there and you had life care. Yes, you could stay there with life care, but if you needed to go get therapy to continue to you know, heal your hip or your knee, you would be paying for that. You would get billed for that. We bill your Medicare so, your Advantage plan so, has coverage, but then you So having, having paid the life care fee, Covers the room board, but it doesn't doesn't change the decision making process about whether the uh, the medical services are provided in the health center, health center or not. Well, nursing uh, is. Uh, yeah, I mean. I'm, 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 yeah, I'm just not quite understanding your question. So, so what does? All right, so in skilled nursing, in what does? Uh, but what things does a, a patient pay who has life care versus not having paid you life would be, care? Like if you were getting um, outpatient rehab, you would be paying for that. Um, labs, x-rays, those types of things, you would be paying for those. In any case. Does so, so if not, your Medicare I'm Advantage paid for your inpatient stay but stopped, I don't know that they would be covering any of those things thereafter. So with regular Medicare, you have Medicare Part A and Part B. Part B covers those types of things and a secondary insurance, so you would be covered as well. And the, med, the traditional Medicare plans normally cover you in skilled nursing. They give you up to 100 days. Um, and when I used, I used to work in a skilled nursing facility for many years before, anybody that came in on Medicare got their 100 days. So with med advantage plans, they're not getting that. So I have, I'm, I'm, so, I'm sorry. Okay. So how many days, if somebody has paid their uh, life care entrance fee, how many days in skilled nursing would they be entitled to? Well, if they bought the life, our life care product, is that what you're saying? The right. life care, okay. So, well, obviously, if, if it's determined that you need to be there, it will cover you until you need to be there, whether it be permanently or short term. It's not a so, number of days. It's, so they're not going to kick you out in 10 days? Like, no, no. No, no. Our, um, if, you have, if you have life care, right. If you don't have life care, you would have to pay for it privately if you stayed in skilled. Or leave Woodland and Farm. Or, yeah. Well, do you mean come back to this and live? No, I mean go to another nursing. You need to stop oh. nursing. Yeah. And you didn't have life care. And you're a contract holder. We, make, we have a bed for you. No, but if you didn't have life care, come on. We still have a bed for you. You just don't pay for it. Christy, Christy, I have the mic. And I would like to say so. Okay. I'm a retired teacher. I belong to a consortium of retired educators that determine what my insurance is beyond, I have advantage. I don't have the choice. What can I do to pressure my consortium to make some other kind of decision that might be better for me? 
I would start to bring these examples to the table and let them know, say, I have people that have had Medicare Advantage plans and they go and they, they don't get the coverage that they need and they don't get the care that they need. Is there any way that we can try to give people choices or? And where do I look for that information? Um, newspaper articles? Yeah, potentially, I mean, we can give you examples of how often it's happened to um, people that we've had in skilled nursing. Thank you. It's, it's an issue. Here. We're waiting a half an hour here. Okay. All right. I didn't have a pension. I was lucky that I inherited some small amounts that may be able to come here. Um, so I've had um, regular Medicare for 20 years. I don't know. A number of years. And uh, it's been very good. Uh, I, had the, I had a supplemental with AARP. And uh, I've had probably $60,000 worth of joint surgery and never had to pay a penny out of pocket, which is very good. Now, I began to think, well, I'm not gonna have any more expensive joint surgery, so, and it's getting in Vermont. Now, this is another issue. I just moved here from Vermont the first few years, shortly thereafter. And I was paying about 300 a month for the whole package. So I don't know what it would be in New York. I've noticed that the car insurance is a lot more expensive here. So that's an interesting question. So I'm thinking of going back to uh, Medicare just because I'm concerned about the future. But uh, I don't know if you have any thoughts about that. Do states vary? Is it truly a federal so, program? Me yeah, Medicare is uh, nationwide. So you can, it's the same coverage whatever state you live in. That's the beauty of it too, that you know, if you need it. Sort of the same thing. premiums? Premium. So, yeah, same. Okay. It's, it's, it's a federal, federal government policy, so it's the same in any state. The supplemental plans would be different from uh, state to state. Okay, that's what you know, I was thinking. Um, like an ADRP here in New York would be quite different premium-wise than Vermont. Than Vermont. Yeah. Okay. Else? But there is, I mean, you can easily research a lot of this stuff online without a doubt. There's, you know, you can get all kinds of ads for them. Sure. Um, I would bring those. I was just in the health care center, and I got a bill. That's where I wanted to see you the day. Yeah, I gave it to Yolanda. She's going to check it out. But I didn't ahead. know what I was charged for because I wanted to see you about it. What am I supposed to be charged for? I have life care. Okay, so I guess I don't know the particulars about why you were there um, and whether you were on a Medicare stay or, or not. I mean, I think we need to talk about this offline to know for sure. I gave you, I'm, I'm assuming it was therapy. I gave it to your mom because she does all that billing. Oh, okay. I, I worked for an insurance company for a while and was selling this and I decided it was not a good deal uh, because- You were selling a Medicare Advantage plan? No, oh. life care. It was prudential policy. Oh, long-term care. Long-term long care, care, yeah. And I think that Medicare plus the setup we have here is all you need. You mean without a secondary? No, you would have um, ARP or whatever. Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah, you have to have that backup, Absolutely. otherwise yeah. it's not good. The A part, they take out automatically. The B, you have to decide. Yeah. Right. No, I agree with you. I think that is all you need. You have all those things. Go ahead, Betsy. How does our long-term care fit into this? Now, you're talking long-term care, care or life care? No, life. We have life care, and we also have long-term long -term care. care. So your long um, your long term care, if you went into skilled nursing, and um, we would submit on your behalf. So say you were there on a life care stay, um, we could submit on your behalf um, for whatever you pay out. You'd be paying your monthly service fee. If you were there on a life care stay, you would still pay a monthly service fee. We would submit on your behalf to, for you to get reimbursed. So you have life care and long term care. Okay. Some people do have that. And then long term care vary a lot. Right. There's some phenomenal policies that pay, you know, five hundred seven dollars a day and then there's some that pay hundred and fifty dollars a day. But um, yeah, we do all that submission on your behalf when the time comes that you need that. Even home care for home care as well. My understanding was if you stay independent living but you need help, aid, that long 
long-term care will pay for that. It's, so she asked if long-term care will pay for aids in your apartment and independent living, and it depends on your policy. So some policies have home care um, sections and they'll pay X amount a day for that, um, and others don't, but. That would be home care. That would be home health services, yes. And normally it has to be through um, like an agency, it could be just a private aid, you know, it has to be somebody licensed or an organization that's licensed. But if anybody ever um, wants me to look at their long-term care policies, or I mean, they're only coming and running down tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I would make an appointment, please you know, make an appointment. I've looked at many people's uh, long-term care policies, their health insurance policies, tried to pick out, you know, we could even go through this whole thing with like, uh, you know, prescription drug plans. I mean, that's a whole other thing. Um, that's the Medicare D piece. So, um, and that's always difficult too. That whole prescription thing used to be easy and now it's, it's uh, very involved. But um, I would certainly uh, look at your plan if you brought it and see, you know, but I, I didn't mean to like to start something with the whole Med A, Med, Med, I'm sorry, the Medicare Advantage, but I think it's important to know because um, I don't think people realize it until they're in that situation and I don't wanna say it's too late, but then when they all call a lot of money. Go ahead. Did you get signed up for this? thing that IBM is offering, like the, the take this advantage thing. Can you go back to Medicare next year? Yeah. Okay. yeah. Yes. So you can enroll and disenroll uh, from Medicare and to an advantage plan. Yeah, they, that's why it's called open enrollment. There's usually the window, October to December, like a two month period um, where you can switch. Is GHI considered a secondary plan? She asked if GHI is a secondary. So yes, that's a, a, a secondary health insurance plan as far as I know. I mean, it, is that? It's what? senior care. It's, uh, it's part of Emblem now. Emblem Health, yeah. There's like Neutral Bombaha, there's the ARP, United Healthcare. I mean, and but yes, GHI. Like, it depends what, what there are many GHI plans. Right. There's it's many plans of each one of those different yeah. levels of coverage. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I can talk to you about GHI. I know we've always had some issues with getting paid from them. It's, they pay, but it just takes a long time. But yeah. everybody wants to get a buy insurance, but then when you need it, you don't want it to pay out. It always takes a while. Um, anybody have anything else? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah.